Welcome. My name is Kevin. I'm your host today. We are here with Andrew Fisher from Choosel, the CEO and co-founder. Thank you, Andrew, for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Kevin. We are continuing to look at uh, DSPs and destinations for agencies to get their ads out there in different opportunities. So we're diving in, rolling up our sleeves with our fireside chat. I've got the fire going behind me. We've got s'mores and, and hot cocoa ready to go for you guys. So sit back, relax, and enjoy our conversation with Chuzel as we dive in today. So thank you, Andrew. Excited to have you on. You know, Chuzel is a household name for so many different agencies, but for a, another group of agencies, it may not be as well known. So it's exciting to really dive in and, and get to know Chuzel kind of personally today with you. Can you take us back to the beginning as, as the co-founder of it? Tell us where Chuzel started and the impetus for getting it off of the ground and um, just kind of the story behind the evolution there. Absolutely. Yeah. And my career and how it led to Chuzel is kind of the, quite frankly, the story of digital media, right? And, you know, out of college, I worked for some of the early ad networks, uh, including L90. Um, I know you're at Adconian, you know, some of those uh, great legacy companies um, from back in the late 90s and early 2000s as well. And, you know, we were trying to solve the same problem, which ultimately was fragmentation, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the internet as a medium, it was, it was obvious that it was destined for growth. Um, but unlike, you know, the traditional mediums, you know, there, there wasn't a finite amount of channels. You literally had uh, millions of websites overnight. So those early ad networks tried to help solve for that, you know, typically on interest-based um, and or, you know, some sort of affinity, uh, perhaps like demographics. And that became a huge business. Um, so from there, I actually went, went to grad school, came out, worked for Interactive Corp, and they were doing a nice job of kind of building uh, their own brands and web gardens uh, at that point, you know, included Expedia, eBay, Ticketmaster. And so you started to see some real scale on a lot of websites, of course. And at that time, you had, in addition to the network, some of the early gardens, if you will, whether AOL, MSN, et cetera. And so you, you continue to kind of see the development of where it was going. And then by the time I you know, started my first company, you, you started to see the, the first um, semblances of exchanges and, uh -huh. um, and what would be the precursor for effectively DSPs, you know, right media, invite, et cetera. And so the last company I started prior to Chusel was an ad network, right? It was a model that still works. You were basically a broker. You helped kind of solve for fragmentation. Um, so agencies could come to a, a single point and get multiple publishers, obviously sometimes hundreds, but you can see the writing on the walls I mentioned with some of these DSPs. So when I exited that partnership, um, you know, I was kicking around different ideas with my, my partner and Jeffrey Finch, who was the co-founder and the first iteration of Chusel was actually quite different than it is today, which is, you know, not uncommon for a, a startup. Um, but we actually, you know, we were focused on digital media, but we actually built a, an engine um, that allowed uh, agencies and media companies to build out these widgets that we called Chuzels. And the Chuzels were effectively a rich media ad unit <clears throat> that were both IAB standard, but we also had some units that lived within social media. And either consumers or brands could build out uh, a Chuzel, which allowed people to visually vote. And so an early partner was like Baskin Robbins, as an example, and you could vote on, you know, which Easter cake you would want and share that on social media. So it was really a, um, really a, uh, an ad creation engine, an ad server that allowed kind of a unique format. So we, we were kind of going down that path, and this was in 2013. Um, you kind of see the writing on the wall, and you've been in this industry a while. Um, you know, creative is really unique, but it's often hard to scale. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of got the same feedback from our agency partners, which is these are great, but basically you build them and send them to us. And so that was a business, but ultimately we, we wanted to ideally build more of a platform uh, that ultimately was self-service. So while we were still kind of tinkering on that model, uh, we had the opportunity to co-build with another company um, that was effectively building out a DMP and they, they had a data set, but they didn't actually have um, anything on the front end, right? So it was still very much a brokerage, you know, via fax and email. So we worked with them on a project basis um, to help them build out the front end of what became their data management platform. And in the meantime, I was kind of working with my, a lot of my friends and in, uh, independent agencies and media, and you could really see the DSP starting to evolve and become an important part of the media execution, especially at the enterprise level. Mm -hmm. And what we saw was there wasn't really a good solution for the, the, the mid-sized marketer, the independent agency. At that time, you had, you know, Turn and Media Math and some of the more enterprise level DSPs. 
Um, but with them came a level of complexity, you know, cost, um, hard to adopt if you're a, a smaller agency. Uh, so most of them still kind of farmed out digital and sometimes they're buying programmatic, but often through a few layers, you know, through their local TV person that then had a seat on a DSP, things like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So our hypothesis was, you know, if we could really simplify um, a software layer that allowed, you know, simple execution of media buying that we think we could go and help a lot of these independent agencies bring it in house. And so when we got to market in the spring of 2014, we were really the first um, self-service DSP designed for the mid-level market and really had a, an early um, kind of lead in the space. But we were so early that most you know, media planners and buyers were like, you know, what are you talking about? You know, we, we buy our media from these people. You know, they take us to concerts and we get great perks and, you know, we'll, we'll never run media in-house. We'll never pull the levers. Um, but we stayed after it. We figured we might be on the right side of, you know, history, so to speak. And ultimately we were, I mean, we started to see a lot more agencies say, Hey, I, I do want control, right? I want the transparency. I want the ability to buy at a variable price instead of a fixed CPM. We want that level of targeting and granularity. We want the ability to, to see our media performance in real time and pull down reports. Um, so we had an interesting part of the market where we, we really focused on super intuitive design, making it very easy to onboard. And we also made it easy to buy. You know, we, we said there's no, you, you don't need a you know a contract. There's no monthly minimums. We're gonna make it really easy for people to adopt the platform. Um, yeah, so that was you know the spring of 2014, and obviously we've had a lot of development since then. But that's really the uh, the origin story, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. It's so funny. People say, oh, you know, I'll never bring that in house, and then you know, all of it's in house now, and, yeah. and people are managing it. It's such a go ahead. Please. I think the interesting thing is the transparency that it brought that people didn't really anticipate um, benefiting from as much as they do, right? You saw the writing on the wall. People wanted more transparency. They wanted flexible pricing models where they didn't have to pay one CPM across the entire channel. They wanted to have a variable CPM based on the performance. And those are the kind of things that you guys really bring to the table that benefit people directly um, and have a massive impact on how they do their buying and how they do their planning. Yeah, and that was one of the, the grand ironies of early digital media was so much of it was transacted in an analog way and offline and through conversations and individual spreadsheets. Um, so it's the rapid innovation and I often use the, you know, it's it's almost like digital media has become an entire stock market where everything, you know, has a price and a value and everyone has equal access um, in real time. So it's, it's been a real democratization in a very good way. So you guys are, you know, it's not just impression-based ad serving, right? It's not banners and, and things. You guys have gone far beyond what you originally set out to and what the ad networks were doing initially is um, just banner buys, et cetera, right? So you guys cover almost all media now at this point, right? Yeah, and, I, and that's why it's the, the name programmatic, I think has really evolved and we almost don't use it anymore. It's really become the automation of media. And mm -hmm. over time, more and more things are now able to be transacted programmatically. And you're correct, right? In the earlier days, it was mostly banners and often even remnant, right? The, the publishers would still either try to sell directly their most premium inventory and sponsorships, and then often, you know, an ad network layer, then it would be pushed to this, um, the longer tail on the DSP side. But ultimately, you know, as Mark Andreessen you know, famously said, you know, software eats the world. And it was really the case within digital media that, okay, if things can be transacted very quickly, and have a market-based approach, um, gosh, it was within a few years, I think even by 2018, you know, over 90% of display um, was tr transacted programmatically. It's just, it's efficient, it's fair, it's real time, it's transparent. And so it evolved very quickly, and obviously with display, and depending on your, your definition of display media, but obviously, you know, video, uh, now new mediums like digital out of home, connected TV is obviously a huge and growing product within the programmatic um, side of it because of the just the giant scale of traditional linear TV as that moves online. It's a just a gigantic opportunity. And so, you know, I, I think there's a point in time, you know, not too far into the future that virtually all media will be automated, um, likely in real time and transacted across uh, any number of software programs that allow, again, even the smallest buyer the same access as the big buyers as well. It creates interesting opportunities for brands and for agencies as well to create unique ROAS models, right? Your, your ad spend on video is different than your ad spend and your budgets are different and your targets are different. And, and the value of the customer that's coming from those different pieces of media 
is different. So they can really customize their programs based on a lot of data analysis that goes on behind the scenes, right? Absolutely. And that's obviously a big area where you guys play. And I, I still think is one of the, the largest opportunities our space is around that kind of not just reporting, but really the attribution piece of understanding what is working when you're comparing things that can be quite different. Like, you know, what is a social conversion off of Facebook? How do you compare that to, you know, something that may have been higher funnel, but ultimately drove a, a search intent purchase at the end of the day. Um, so that's still a very exciting field. And, you know, we, uh, our clients tend to be smaller and midsize. So the adoption curve tends to be a little bit behind um, you know, traditional enterprise players that have the resources and may have multiple data scientists on staff. But I, I think really unlocking that value so people have that more complete picture of the overall media spend um, is, a, is a huge area of opportunity moving forward. Yeah. You know, it's interesting you talk about small and medium businesses as kind of one of the key aspects you guys are going after. What we have seen is a much higher adoption on local businesses into the digital market space, right? They're not just doing mailers uh, and anymore. They're really trying to figure out, hey, with this pandemic, we've had really had to shift our focus and there's different communications that we have to do and there's different things we need to be looking at. They're now able to step in to this digital marketplace, this digital environment that you guys have created in new and unique ways and leverage what has been out of reach for them for so long. Absolutely. And that's, you know, I, I, I always say, you know, the, the media investment will always focus, you know, will always follow where the consumers are. And that's, you know, obviously been the huge uh, shift to digital. And, you know, for some decades now, people consume so much more of their media digitally, but there's always been a lag of the, the media dollars moving that direction. And I think you're starting to see that now on the local side as well, where they are used to doing things perhaps more traditionally and buying linear TV on the local news. Um, some of the, you know, billboards and perhaps, you know, again, more traditional mediums, um, you know, typically when you move into the digital side, some of the, the lowest hanging fruit will be search, right? Um, and, you know, they'll adopt search and often even social because it's, they're, they're giant walled gardens that it's easy to get your hands around, you know, with a, with a single person with a hands-on keyboard. And I think, you know, where we represent, which is kind of everything else, you know, the display slash programmatic side, um, it is still incredibly complex and fragmented. And so there is a lot of value to be provided to that consumer. And if you can simplify it, it, it really helps them. And often, you know, those channels are where we provide, whether it's video, you know, banners, even connected TV, a lot of the times it's going to be higher in the funnel as well. And so the opportunity, especially with local and small, medium-sized businesses, is, is the education piece and understanding how all of these digital channels uh, work together and what you're really looking at is, you know, the total ROAS, as you mentioned, you know, what, 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 what am I getting when I put all of these channels together? Um, and I, I think there's a tremendous opportunity to really unlock a lot of value still on the SMB side of the, the digital media ecosystem. Yeah. You know, you talked about linear TV and, and the transition to digital TV now that we're seeing and the opportunity for these local businesses to participate in video in ways that were never open to them before you had to have much larger budgets, uh, even to get into local cable TV, you still had to have larger budgets. And now you can get on to, to CTV or um, out of the home video assets with your commercials, with your messaging in ways that were never available to them before. So it's mm -hmm. a whole new marketplace for them. And it's exciting, right? Because it's, those are one of the things that were the easiest thing to describe as, you know, a television commercial, right? And now when you, you know, you're meeting with someone, you say, you know, we can put you on that screen on the wall. And unlike, you know, often, you know, through more traditional distribution mediums, you know, we have that level of addressability. We can do the finite targeting. Yes, we can put you in the NBA game, but we're just going to hit these types of households versus blanketing an entire market. And so that's probably the most exciting part of our industry right now in terms of products would it be that unlocking that value of connected TV. There's both been a tremendous amount of demand coming in because of this, the, the unique ability to democratize a medium that used to just be the biggest brands in the world. And right. even again, on a local scale, maybe just be the car dealerships that have the kind of money, you know, to, to invest uh, locally at scale. Uh, but now it's truly democratized and the ability to, to buy smaller, uh, to understand what's working and optimize from there. And where that goes is really exciting because, you know, in conjunction with the demand, obviously, uh, with the pandemic, we've had a tremendous increase in supply as well, right? So many more users and consumers have either cut the cord and or are consuming more of their, uh, their digital media over the top or through connected TV channels. 
And so you're seeing a very efficient marketplace growing on both sides. And it, again, it's really exciting um, because there is, that is such a unique medium, right? To have full-size rendering of video-based advertising in front of a captive audience. So there's a reason that TV um, has been such a, a gigantic medium in the space. But again, now you layer on that addressability um, and the attribution, it, it really is becoming a, a force in the industry. Uh, that's fantastic. You know, it used to be, and I keep pounding on small businesses, but it, it, it seems to be relevant to this conversation that, yeah. you know, the drive by traffic was really where you would, you, you, you got the location. It was about location, 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 right? Because you wanted the drive by traffic. And if the drive by traffic isn't there, how do you continue to get people to come in? Or if they're concerned about, is it safe to come in? Do you do, what, what are the protocols that I have to do to come in? Do I need an appointment? All these other kind of things are going through people's minds and medium businesses as well. You know, banks and car dealerships are trying to say, hey, it's safe to come in. How do they get that message out? And TV is one of the fantastic ways of doing that or video, I should say, digital video. Mm -hmm. And it also justifies, it, it, it substantiates people's company, right? If you can see it on TV, you're like, hey, I saw you on TV. You know, all your yep. neighbors are saying that or, or whatnot. And oh, totally. it, 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 <clears throat> hey, we're in business. We're still open. You know, we're, yep. we're still here, here, you know, come on in, come see us um, or we'll come to you. All these other kind of messages are coming out now as part of the advertising of how safe it is to work with these companies. Yep. And you guys giving access to that is phenomenal. That's, that's really great. Yeah, it, it's it's so unique, right? Because uh, historically, the, the TV medium was one of brand, right? And that's what brands want to do. They want to create you know, a very strong association with their brand and their products. So people will pay more for that because of the association of it. And again, I, that, that doesn't go away. And a lot of our clients either are doing a mix of branding and, you know, um, you know, really trying to focus on direct marketing, getting, you know, a call to action. And you can have a, a blend of both of those. But what I think kind of comes out of it is, you know, local and smaller companies can almost do more surgical branding, right? They want to build a brand with the right audience that that they they that is either their current customer base or the ones that they want to expand into. And so, again, you don't have to have so much waste and target an entire market. Really start building that brand and the call to action to go with it. Yeah, that's exciting. So you guys have some unique products that allow people to come in. You talked about making it easy for for customers to come onto the platform. Um, how are you kind of re-envisioning what the term DSP is and how do you continue to make it easy for people? I know you kind of have a couple different things with Choosel Go and Choosel Pro. And um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I talk about this with my team all the time. You know, the it, when we were going to market, you know, the, the platform was the pitch, right? Just, just show it to them. You know, they can see what it is. Like, wow, I can log in and run this. Um, as the, the industry has you know, really uh, evolved and matured, um, you know, for us to continue to be relevant and grow with our partners, what we found is you know, uh, programmatic display is just one thing that they want to do. And it's been great that the industry has grown, that more and more things have become automated. And so we're often you know, in the bucket of DSPs, you know, demand side platform. And in the literal sense, you know, we are. We sit on the demand side, meaning the buyers. We work with agencies. We work with brands that want to set up campaigns and run them to reach their end clients. And so we sit on that demand side, um, but not different than you. We, we kind of fancy ourselves more of an operating system on the ad tech side. Mm -hmm. So our goal as we continue to grow is we're really good from a technology side, integrating into existing systems. And as an example, we can partner, we do partner with LiveRamp in terms of onboarding and matching and Oracle Data Cloud for insights. And as we grow, especially on the buy side, that is our goal is to continue to integrate additional partners uh, the most recent uh, one that we're working on today is Amazon, right? So we, mm. we offer Amazon DSP as a service-based solution currently, and then we are integrating to their DSP in real time. And so uh, sometime in 22, that you'll be able to log in and say, oh, I can buy on Amazon through the Choosel DSP. And so that kind of illustrates our strategy of not going like super vertical, meaning, you know, we're not, we're not trying to you know, be like a Google as an example, that it's completely vertically integrated across the supply and demand side, or goes more horizontal on the demand side and continue to plug into great, um, you know, scalable media outlets as they continue to develop. So, you know, as an example, you know, could TikTok be on the horizon, you know, et cetera. So that is the goal is that, you know, to make it very easy for 
small and mid-sized businesses to transact across the entire spectrum of digital media through our system and always focusing on what we're really good at, which is intuitive design, making it easy uh, to log in, learn the system, run these campaigns, because that's ultimately what drives performance. Right. And then really coupling that with great service and support along the way. So service and support, you know, on a, on a self-serve platform, it's supposed to be easy, mm-hmm. but we all run into problems, right? We all yes. say, okay, this is all self-serve, but now I need help. I have this question or I have this kind of thing I want to target. Talk yep. to me a little bit about the support that you guys add to that self-serve to really give people that level of comfort of coming on the platform. Yeah, it's a great question, right? And it, it was once basically a necessity for us to be super, super lean. So everything had to be super intuitive and all of our support was designed to be online, asynchronous. Um, you go through Chusel Academy at your own time. Um, that being said, you know, as we've grown in this industry, it's, it's interesting, right? Because, you know, when you get a partner into the system, you know, the, the better trained they are, the more they learn, the better performance they're going to drive. They're going to grow and become a better client because they're growing their business alongside mm-hmm. of you. And so there is that level of finding the right balance of support, training, onboarding, uh, that human element. And I've, I've become fond of saying, especially internally, that there's, there's no such thing as a truly self-service demand side platform. Um, at some level, you know, people are going to demand and want the training, the onboarding, the teaching of the core platform itself. And then also it's evolving very quickly, right? We're adding new products and features all the time. And so, you know, yes, logging on and having a script and showing them that is important. Some people may, that may be all they want or need and say, I don't want to talk to anyone. Others are going to want to say, hey, yeah, let, let's talk through this new connected TV supply source. What does that mean? You know, right. if I buy on Amazon, Twitch, you know, what, what is that? Can you walk me through that? And so it's finding that right balance, right? And I, the one thing I think we've been done pretty good over the years, you know, because we've always been lean is, Let's automate everything we can, but always provide excellent human-based support and training uh, for all of our clients. And so if you do the right blend of that, it really helps to be able to scale. You know, and to that end, we have about 700 platform clients. And I think our account management organization is, is still under 15 people. Um, and so we've been able to find that right balance of, you know, servicing our clients so they have the support and the guidance and the expertise they need to grow but doing it in a way that really empowers them to doing it on their own, especially over time as they work with us. You talk about balance, and I think that's the key word there, right? There, there's, there's so much that can be done autonomously that people can come in and do, but having that safety net behind the scenes that customers, agencies, brands know that they can reach out if they have questions, they need help, or they run into yep. a roadblock, or they have a, a unique opportunity, right? We all have unique opportunities that come our way, and they're like... Sure okay, how do I deal with this, this thing now um, yeah. is fantastic. That's great. So you guys make it easy. You have a scalable platform. You have all these different media types and sources. You have the service and support to go along behind it. Um, we've talked about all of that. Talk to me about, and the, the audience at large, about where the future is. You know, we, there's so many different topics that are on the table for digital uh, cookie list tracking, uh, 5G, you know, what, what do you guys see as kind of the future um, without giving away too much, obviously? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll save the, the Web3 conversation um, <laughs> pro- probably for another year as I, I'm still yeah. unpacking that one. Um, you know, it, it's because where we sit in the industry, we don't necessarily have to be on the bleeding edge, so to speak, mm-hmm. um, because uh, the adoption curve typically for small, medium clients is is a little bit behind the the uh, the enterprise level players, marketers, and holding companies. So we do have the benefit of understanding a little bit. Say, okay, this is working well at the highest levels. We're going to incorporate that. You know, that being said, the, these trends, you know, around uh, the consumption media, around data, um, they affect everyone, right? And so it's it's interesting to see you know, if we focus on the the cookieless environment. And you know, I've, I've shared thoughts on this and in, in different blog posts. It's it's ultimately the consumers aren't going to change their habits. They're only going to be consuming more things digitally over time. Uh, that's an inevitable march of the digitization that's affected every industry, including media. And so the function of how we perhaps build audiences and targets, that's going to evolve, right? Mm-hmm. And it, where it seems like the, the cookie is, is such a monumental piece of the industry, 
it's, it is ripe for change, right? As you probably well know, and a lot of the listeners do, the, the cookie wasn't designed to be the backbone of the ad tech industry as far as the targeting side goes, right? It was designed to be a code snippet for storage of information, a personalized websites, et cetera. And it will still serve that purpose ostensibly for most publishers. But we can and will get better at targeting with a balance that really, uh, that balances the needs and brands to drive um, targetable performance, but also balancing with the needs and privacies of consumers. And that's, mm -hmm. it's fairly easy to do. And I think, you know, in the nearest future, it is going to be a little bit of, you know, Marty McFly and perhaps back in the future a little bit where as the systems kind of rebuild and developing smart ways and whether it's unified, you know, 1.0 um, or the unified ID with the trade desk and some of the things that our you know, friends at LiveRamp are working on, some of the Walt Gardens trying to push that out, you know, whether it's the flocks with Google, these are all experimentation to kind of provide a framework that allows for the, the right level of addressability to drive performance. Uh, but again, balancing with the consumer. And I, I do think it's important to look at it from the, the consumer standpoint as well. Um, when you talk about privacy kind of holistically, most consumers instinctively, yes, I want privacy. Um, but they don't really understand what that means, especially in the context of media. It's when you really dig in with them to understand, you know, when there is better targeting, you're getting better, uh, better messages that are more relevant to you, right? And by the way, these messages, the better targeted they are, it provides a better experience for the consumer but also enables these publishers, again, whether it's a, a streaming media channel, whether it's a website, whether it's an app, if they have better targeting, they're able to provide their services either free or at a better discount to you, right? And so there's that real trade-off with the consumer around privacy, what they're getting from the publisher side and the targetability. So it will evolve. I, it's, it's definitely not a sky is falling moment as the cookie deprecates. And ultimately, you know, with the leadership across all organizations, including ours, we're, we're working towards better frameworks that will afford that. And again, I'm always comforted just by going back to this medium is gigantic and will continue to grow if you just follow the consumer habits. How we target people and perhaps attribution, there, there's gonna be hiccups and changes along the way, there always has been. And this is just the most recent chapter in that. And one thing that I do as we kind of wrap this up, we talked a lot about local, small and, and medium businesses, but you guys have the scale for national and, and international as well, right? So. Mm -hmm. People can come to you with large campaigns, with small campaigns, um, geo-targeted, geo-fenced, you know, all that kind of stuff you, you have the capability of doing. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to make sure we don't just pigeonhole you guys into, into small and medium businesses. You do play in the enterprise space and you do have the, the scale to reach everybody and, and anybody that a client would want. Yeah, it's interesting, right? It's, you know, you, 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 you pick your lanes over time, right? And there's a reason that we we chose the SMBs. We we think there was a real value to unlock there. I would say over time, our our deal client profile has gone up a little bit in terms of level of spend. We work with more regional advertisers, you know, sometimes nationally. If they get to a certain size, it can make sense for them to go directly plug into an enterprise DSP because they either have the resources to build their own team around it. And it's, it's just a different value proposition when you get to that level. You know, that being said, as we continue to add uh, more and more products and services horizontally, as I mentioned, I, I think it can and will expand our customer base as well, especially with brands that are looking to do more things in house over time. Um, so we're, we're looking to kind of stay in our lane, so to speak, I would say perhaps a little bit more towards the M versus the S mm -hmm. over time. Um, but a, the trends that have made Chusel successful, you know, the focus on self-service, uh, the simplicity of accessing multiple products through a single system, having one point of contact, you know, whether it's small, whether it's medium, eventually enterprise, I think is a compelling value proposition, which we'll continue to focus on for sure. Sounds great. Well, Andrew, this has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for peeling back the layers of the onion on Chuzel and giving us a, a, you know, a peek behind the scenes of what's going on and kind of personalizing the whole experience. So definitely no encourage you know, agencies and brands to reach out to Chuzel. They've got a really clean system and a, and a platform that's really designed and specifically to meet the needs of those uh, SMB customers out there. So give them a look-see. Um, and uh, you know, that's, that's our story for today. So thank you so much for joining us and wish you the best of luck. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's been fun. And uh, we appreciate our partnership with TapClicks. And we look forward to working with you guys in the future. Thanks for listening. Absolutely. Thanks, guys.